Um, so thanks so much for, for joining us so that we can talk about cybercrime, which um, I'm sure you know has been a focal point of your careers now for years. Um, uh, it, I run a, a hacker company. Um, I'm a hacker CEO. Uh, White Ops is a security company, and we never intended to be in the advertising space at all. We just found that uh, doing ad fraud, and especially video fraud, is is one of the wildly profitable uses of a botnet. So, so now we're here, and um, I'm going to kick things off just with a couple of questions uh, to you both, and then I'll wander around a little, and and we can get some uh, some cool questions and feedback coming from the crowd as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kick things off um, with, with a question to you, Jen. Um, in, in my experience, um, you don't want whitehead hackers doing your media planning. Um, in, in your experience doing media planning, um, how is, is cybersecurity actually affecting the work? Is this a problem that you have to deal with? And, and, and you know, are agencies capable? Are agencies capable of doing media planning or buying or figuring out where the fraud is? Of, of dealing with the, the fraud. Yeah, so uh, yes, agencies are capable of dealing with the fraud if they want to invest the time. It's a lot of overhead and clients, we can't charge clients to minimize their fraud because our clients will come back to us and say, well, why were you investing with this company that has 50% fraud? And we go back to the client and say, well, we uncovered it. It's not what they sold into us. Um, but so yes, agencies are able to do it, but we have to find the right partners who are uh, forthcoming and uh, are working in partnership to minimize the fraud. We're always gonna have fraud. We've already understood that it will happen, uh, but we have to figure out collectively with our partners and with our clients to make sure everybody understands the, the limitations uh, and then also where the, the hackers are coming from and communicate to the clients how soon we will put the preventative measures in place and how we will get the uh, sellers to compensate the brands for the fraud activity. Right, right. And, and Cheryl, how, how are you keeping an eye on this issue? Is it something that, that you have visibility into? Yeah, absolutely. We are, um, I, I, I feel like we've all sort of gone back to school and we're, we're taking crash courses, mm -hmm. um, a lot of clients in, in fraud mm -hmm. and all of, all of this. And, uh, we're voracious in reading, meeting with industry partners like yourself, uh, working with the ANA on some different committees, and um, working really closely with our team at Digitas, you know, their ad ops team, and uh, really partnering with them to see what their leadership is in the space. But we're, we're sourcing from a lot of different partners um, to ensure that we've got a good view on what's going on. It's, it's particularly, particularly important for everyone, but you know, the minute you see a headline in the Wall Street Journal about bot fraud and, um, and you know, what's going on, it, 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 the industry and the digital piece of the industry and what we're doing with our franchisees dollars, it, it loses credibility for everyone. And I would say on the seller side, if the, uh, the publishers, the sellers, the vendors are forthcoming with which preventative measures that they've put in place, what they are doing to invest on that side with uh, IAS or Moat or others, to be forthcoming with that information because as a media strategist and a buyer, when my team is executing campaigns and the sellers come back to us and say, there is no fraud on our, on our platform, that's, you know, that's poppycock. And we have to then spend hours on end to prove that there's fraud, which is ridiculous. It's not like we're the CIA or the FBI. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. No, let me understand the crowd. So, so uh, of the people who showed up to this panel, how, how many? How many are on the buy side? How many buyers do we have here? And and how many on the sell side? Purely on the sell side. And then, if you're an uncategorizable tech player, cool. <laughs> that's that's me. Cool. All right. Um, so. Uh, obviously, bots aren't buying tacos, but on the other hand, um, they they do they will deliver. They on, on now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they do deliver performance, though. So, what, what happens when what happens when the bots are, are are giving you the performance metrics that that you want in terms of of, of clicks or or in terms of reach at a, at a particular price point? You know, if if it is an ongoing if it is an ongoing problem, then this means that sometimes you realize after the fact that you got it wrong. 
And how, how do you communicate that? This is a question I suppose for you, Jen. How can you communicate to a client that the, you know, uh, our earlier baseline of performance was actually probably off because maybe that was the bots that were delivering that awesome CTR. And so it's not gonna happen like that again. Well, uh, my team is so frustrated with me because I am a pessimist. If I see that high click-through rate, I do want to know who's actually clicking on a banner. So obviously something is, is amiss with that. Uh, our team every day is looking at the numbers so we can see trends along the way. And once we start to see a spike or a bunch of traffic from Ireland when it's a US only campaign, we know something is amiss. And then we are very proactive with our clients. We're talking with our clients on a daily basis because our clients are very smart. And so we are forthcoming with them about it, very transparent about it, and um, set the expectations with them that something is awry and uh, communicate what preventative measures we are putting into place too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so are you seeing sellers compete on, on matters of quality or are they just, are they just rising to the standards of quality that you're setting? Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. So there are, especially in the programmatic side or the automated side of the, the table, there are different elements and personalities that are involved with the mix. We have the sales folks and I have many friends who are on the sales side. They come in with the dog and pony show and they sell us all about their technology and whatnot. And once we sign the IO, I can't find them anymore. And so then all of a sudden, our campaign goes to ad ops on the sales side. This campaign person has no background or history about how in the weeds our agency is and how pessimistic I am uh, in terms of uh, positive activity. That ad ops person has no clue in terms of what they're dealing with. And the salesperson is nowhere to be found. So I would say it's, um, there's no, I, I have yet to see a, a seller or ad ops or technology partner take the responsibility and figure out how to fight crime uh, mm -hmm. in conjunction with our clients and us as an agency. All right, well, uh, can, we, can we get any sellers to, to talk about their experience? Uh, so I saw a lot of hands go up, people on the sell side here. Who is competing on quality? Is there someone making this a competitive differentiator that wants to share their thoughts or I experience? I can interject, there are some uh, sellers, technology providers that are providing 100% guaranteed non-fraud or uh, viewable impressions. And that is their, their mantra and they have delivered on it, but there are few and far between on that because what we've done in is, as an industry, nobody can really guarantee unless it's their own inventory. Right, right, yeah, exactly, right. Um, this kind of problem can't distort the market to the degree that it does if, if real quality differentiation is happening, right? So, so are we seeing that emerging? Do we have people who are who are competing on the, the quality, the guarantee front? Hi, I'm Christina from Zaxis and just led a discussion on, on this topic, so uh, I have to, have to say. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you mentioned lots of overhead. Definitely, it's something that takes a big data approach, right? You need to be pulling in lots of different types of, of data, which is what we do to be continually monitoring, because um, just looking at Viewability, let's say, isn't enough. Um, there's, and fraud is just insidious, right? And needs to be really, really carefully monitored. But what we found is it's also really expensive to get quality video. And we've gotten a lot of pushback um, from, um, you know, just g in general about price and needing to beat um, cable CPMs, let's say. So there's this tension between needing to hit a specific price and also needing to, and, and having the integrity as a company that we want to be only in the, the best environments and fraud-free environments. And that's just difficult to navigate. Um, and you know we're trying to lead in that area. So are, are you dealing with buyers who just want their reach numbers, damn it, and would prefer that you just get it from wherever you can? There are all types of clients out there. <laughs> well, and we talked yesterday, Cheryl and I were in the same uh, conversation yesterday about data, and uh, we were talking about the C-suite and what the C-suite is looking for in terms of media performance. And it is our responsibility as senior management and, and running an agency to educate the brands in terms of opportunities for data and analysis. So our clients, very high up that we're not dealing with on a daily basis, they are saying, this is, 
this is the internet. Why don't we have such a low CPM? We don't have the chance to ladder up that education because when people are buying Super Bowl spots, there is nobody's flapping their, their wings, uh, their feathers, based on the, the high cost of entry. But that's quality. And why aren't we demanding that from the, the sales side, too? Well, we are demanding it. Why aren't we getting it? I, I, would, I would add to that. I was thinking that um, when you were speaking earlier that you know, driving up the CPM to have you know, a legitimate human impression doesn't seem, I mean, asking for a human impression doesn't seem like a big ask, and that doesn't <laughs> seem like something I should pay a CPM increase right. for. Right. Um, if that's the case, I mean, it, it goes back to the credibility of the marketplace and right. the digital video space, that um, if, if, if I can't assume I've got human impressions, then I, I mean, I, I don't, we have it, vendors. It's, it's crazy to me. We have vendors <laughs> jacking up CPMs 300% because we're demanding 100% viewability, just like Erin was saying the other day. And I, I go back to the vendors and I say, what the hell were you selling us before? Like, why did you even think that this was acceptable? And again, I would say on the sales side, it's, uh, there's not full transparency or disclosure about what they are selling. They may not know themselves. Yeah, true. But again, having that, so there's, I don't, we're all having our own responsibilities, uh, but I don't see a common thread beyond the fraud and knowing that there's a problem to rectify the issue. I'll, I'll add that at White Ops, we've seen uh, viewability guarantees uh, d actually increasing uh, the bots that appear in some media buys because if, if you open a negotiation saying, hey, I want 100% I want viewability and I want to pay the same price that I was paying last year, there are some people who are going to push back against that because a viewability guarantee constrains supply. And, and some people will just fold. So think about all of the players that fold and say, sure, okay, fine. The CPM will stay the same and I'll give you 100% viewable now. The ones that can afford to say that are the ones that are actually shoving bots in the door. So they're just making it up by adding to the denominator. So, so we've seen as as buys have transitioned to, to guarantees on viewability, the bot numbers actually rise because much of the bot population has been upgraded at this point so that it can fake viewability according to all the major viewability measures. And so that's just actually distorting the market, the market more because the effect of all this bot traffic is to make up the difference between what, what's getting bought today and, and the amount of actual inventory that there is to sell. All right, I'm gonna race over to you. Uh, I, have, I actually have the mic, so <laughs> All right. I'll jump in and then hand yes. it back to you. Um, so I'm from Google, and on the Google side, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and I'd love your reactions on what's working and what's not working. I would, working. because uh, we've had challenges with GDN massively, too. Okay, good. I'll speak to YouTube and um, awesome. some of the AdX stuff, but I'd love sure. to hear the GDN stuff, too. So on the YouTube side, as you all know, we've been very, very focused on viewability. We just announced the third-party viewability last week, but even more than the reporting, what we talk a lot about is the player you know, ends up with 90% viewability on the ad inventory. So beyond just the reporting, actually really high viewability rates. On the fraud side, again, for video just with AdX, all the work we're doing you know, to just predict where the fraud is going to come from and make sure those publishers don't end up in the, in the exchange. I'd love your thoughts there. I know the GDN is a separate issue and it has more problems, but on the video side, would love your feedback on what's working and what's still a challenge. Yeah, I would say the, um, the cost per engagement has always been promising for us uh, with the YouTube side of things. And it's also the, being able to measure the, the uptick, the lift, and the, um, the increase in reach because of you're able to correlate one to one. People saw it and they're actually sharing it. Absolutely. X percent. I think what Tony Hawk had said the other day uh, when it was asked, like, what do you think is working from the social side? He said, I can measure right away. I can see if a thousand of my followers are now sharing this out. And so being able to have that immediate uh, lift and increase in exposure is what we as an agency value because it's actually happening. Yeah. And we're, we're definitely excited to see Google you know, and YouTube with what you announced last week become more transparent. I mean, that's, that's really what we need. We need from all of our partners is the increased transparency. You know, will bot fraud always exist? It, you know, as long as there's money, there's gonna be criminals. So in any, in any industry, but you know, with, with the increased transparency and partnership between you know, brands and, and publishers, I think what, what we can do is pivot the conversation from sort of, you know, what we call the, what is it, the right side of the decimal point 
to having the conversation focused on the bigger ideas, the bigger things that are going to move our business forward. And you know what? We, we've got a transparent, open relationship there. We'll handle that, and we'll, we'll make it good. Great, and I totally agree that the um, relationship, we've done a lot of work, but the relationship between the seconds in view, it's not just the two seconds as we saw earlier, but the seconds in mm -hmm. view and the brand lift, it's mm -hmm. the best indicator mm -hmm. of the actual ability to lift the brand metrics. So right. the ability is really important. And we've had fraud or increase in uh, impression levels, even in print, mm -hmm. uh, especially being on the agency side, we have a bunch of magazines that are in the office because of subscription rates and pass along rates. So we, but that has, be, what's interesting is that from print too, that became accepted, that all right, well we know that there's some Michigas that happens over there. From the technical side, because we're very intelligent folks and we know all of the intricacies that can happen, uh, in a positive way we're not accepting it, uh, that fraud should be happening or that there's 10%. What I find the challenge is, is that we are told that it is not happening and that our technology is not uh, fraud prevalent. That the lack of transparency or understanding on that side is very frustrating. Because then I feel like I'm lying to our clients. I hate going to our clients and saying, you know what, the explanation that we received from the technology partner last week is totally off base. They came back and apologized. So now we have lost credibility with our clients because we are going with what we understood uh, the technology partner to be selling to us. Michael, can I go, for can it. I go back to the, the point that you made earlier on um, <clears throat> about the sellers that are uh, keeping the CPMs, um, basically guaranteeing 100% viewability, but mm -hmm. keeping the CPMs the same. Those are the ones that are probably at the greatest risk of inviting bot, bot uh, traffic in. Is this an MRC accreditation issue? Is the MRC so laser focused on viewability that they're forsaking it, anything that's happening on, on the fraudulent traffic side? Because this is the first time that I personally have heard that those two things actually work against each other. Um, and I think a lot of us know that the MRC accreditation is probably a little loose, um, and there's all these different methods for, for view, viewability measurement. But and do we as it's not even standardized on mobile yet. That's the challenging part, too. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, uh, do we as agencies and brands need to start pushing back against the MRC and, and getting them to focus on both viewability and, and fraud? Right, I, that's a great question. So there's no MRC accreditation standard for fraud detection. Um, but the MRC has been doing some great work towards that. And, and so we're expecting one either at the end of the year or, or early next year. Um, so, so it almost feels like that needs to be a component of the viewability. So right. basically, you, you could be accredited for viewability, but you can't let, you can't balance it out this way, you know? Right. Well, I, I, think, I think the biggest question that, that, that we could address as a group here has to do with um, about the incentives of taking on this problem. because. Um, what, what this market distortion illustrates is that, broadly speaking, everyone continuously underestimates the skill of our adversaries. The, um, the, the cyber criminals that we're up against are, are really good, but they're not all really good because it's not as if they're all getting together and comparing notes. So, so, that, so they're frankly easier to catch botnets than, than others. And imagine that you run a platform. So, so you know, let's look at um, uh, let's look at AdX. There are a lot of independent suppliers, and uh, they may or may not be sourcing bot traffic. And, and some of those operations are going to be easier to catch than others. Does a platform do a better job at purging the fraud than its buyers can do in identifying the fraud? Right? Is, is, is there actually an incentive there to go above and beyond? Um, if you know that all the buyers are using relatively simple fraud detection mechanisms, like, can you afford to go above and beyond? Um, can you afford to purge not just the obvious bots that are going to get caught by your buyer's analytics platforms, but, but also catch the more sophisticated bots that are going to, to game the viewability measurements and, and game other metrics of, of interaction? Um, it's not clear that, that platforms can afford to adopt a higher quality standard than their buyers can actually um, differentiate because what will happen if you, if you purge performant bots, if you purge the bots that fake viewability or that, you know, or that engage with content or sign up for something or put something in a shopping cart, is that all of those KPIs will drop and then maybe your buyer will just shift their dollars to a platform that has those high performing bots. 
right? So if the buyers can't actually tell the quality of what they're getting, if they're going to be duped by the sophisticated bots that know how to game those metrics, then I, I don't think it's at all clear that the platforms can actually afford to enforce a higher standard than the buyers get. And right now, the buyers' tools are very imprecise. You know, they're they, imprecise. We also have uh, the scale that we have allowed with the uh, dot extensions, dot club, dot this, dot that. So now we have this issue with dot edu, dot gov, dot com, and now we're doing dot gen Brady. So all of those ex, uh, extraneous elements have just increased the margin of error ever so much greater. And nobody's pushing back on that, though, either. And what's challenging also, so when we're looking at the data side of things, and yes, there could be fraudulent traffic percentage happens, and when all the automation and the programmatic starts going along those lines and getting all that data, when do we know in that precise moment of time when we started to veer off course? And so right. we, we can't go to our client and say, well, it was Monday when we had all this fraudulent traffic, and now we have to go and reset the machine back to, set to uh, Saturday. Now we've just wasted money, thought leadership money, our clients' dollars, and their overall investment. So I, I, I wish I had an answer. Um, well, well, I think that's, though, where, where it's got to be that the, the client, the agency, and the, you know, the publishers or the providers all in it together. Because mm -hmm. in, in, in that case, I mean, I can't understand, you know, and maybe it happens, tell me if it does, but where you couldn't go back and talk to the publishers that you've identified where the, the bot fraud is coming in and figure out some sort of mutually agreeable solution to, to help offset that damage. And what's interesting is that from starting that conversation, it has, we have seen that it takes over a week for the technology providers to unearth where the problem is, and now the algorithm has another seven days of activity. Mm -hmm. So in theory, yes, yeah. um, but we're not sitting with ad ops on the technology side to actually hunker down because we're low priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jen, I think you really nailed it. The, uh, the goal of a cyber criminal is not, a bot operator in, um, in particular, is not to have their bots go undetected forever. It's, it's just to make enough money between when you infect a new computer and it goes discovered to, to pay off that infection. So you don't have to you don't have to make your bots go undiscovered forever. You just have to make enough money in between the new infection and when discovery happens, and then you just keep infecting new machines. Now, I saw some hands come up earlier, so I'm ready to chase down whoever's next. All right, you're closer. And my question is, is uh, once these publishers uh, commit the fraud, how do they stay in business after that point? <laughs> right, well, what happens is, uh, so I had worked at a very large agency back in the day, and um, I'm heavily involved on the day-to-day -day at the agency I founded. We're a small but mighty team. Those publishers are able to remain in business because there are clients and holding companies that are spending multi-million dollars. And if 10% of a multi-million dollar budget is fraudulent, there's 90%, $90 million that's not fraudulent. When we're working with clients that $100,000, $150,000, a 10% margin of error or fraud is huge for them. And so I would say that those partners are still staying in business because I, I'm going to walk out of here and probably get taken down by somebody, but <laughs> <laughs> I do have a lot of sales friends. Um, what's happening is it's smoke and mirrors again. So then all, all of a sudden a new research study or a new uh, product offering or uh, exclusivity comes into play, and it's relationships that keeps the keeps work capitalist, right. keeps okay. it going. We, we have had to remove, tail. though, we've had to remove a partner before in the past due to some issues. So, I mean, we... We made the call within a week, and you know, luckily our IOs were mm -hmm. established properly in advance. Recommendation to brands um, that that is done, but we did we did have to remove a partner quickly, and and they actually came clean and were like, oh my god, we went out and bought all this inventory, and you know, we were trying to deliver and we didn't know. So um, I mean, yes, it's done. It was interesting this morning. Um, I accidentally received an email from a vendor who comes in to sell to us, and he wouldn't guarantee, or they, it wouldn't guarantee on uh, viewability terms and not to raise the pricing. They accidentally sent me an email today about where they were buying their inventory. It was not meant to the agency. It was meant to someone on the exchange. Oops. And it was very eye-opening. It was very eye-opening to see what type of conversations happened. 
Wow. Always look to see who you're sending emails to. <laughs> And the terms too, like when, we're, again, I'm, we're losing creativity on the media side, on the, the buyer side, and we, there is no strategy anymore, it feels like. I spend the majority of my time reading the fine print on IOs. I think I'm up to like 2.0 with my readers now. And what's happening is that there is no consistency. Like we did the IEB and the T's and C's and uh, with the four A's and we're at 3.0 now. But there is no consistency about viewability guarantee because it depends on if you use, uh, this gentleman had mentioned it depends on if you use this verification tool versus that verification tool. It's like if then what scenarios. And here we're just trying to invest money in the right way to make everybody happy when in fact there, there's too much, uh, there's so much logistics to, to find what is, we're all wanting to be good people. I, I don't know, it's just, it dumbfounds me. Hi, Mark from Torrential. We're a mobile video company. We hand select the publishers that we work with but we can't control what the publisher does and where they choose to buy their own traffic sometimes. Um, there are good companies and there are bad, we all know that. But you know, we don't buy off exchanges, so we know exactly who we work with and it's a very tight list of names that we all know. But as the seller against their inventory, we can't control what they're doing on their end. So you know, earlier you were talking about the sellers disappear. We can't control that, right? Well, we've, we've been a victim of this. Uh, it happened a couple years ago with a top tier video partner. And they were saying the same thing. But when we bought the inventory, we were buying it on their premier partnership platform. We found out because they couldn't meet that guarantee, somebody in their office went and bought the inventory off an exchange just to fulfill the contract. Right, so that now comes back to the transparency of where you're running. So again, whichever partner you're working with, we in particular are actually fully transparent front and back. We'll actually show you exactly where you ran. Oh, they were very transparent until the pessimist <laughs> totally came out and said, what's right. going on here? And then I think the last thing is these bot networks that are out there, it's not even sometimes the publisher that's buying inventory. They can just choose to go attack the New York Times. They can go choose to attack any publisher of high quality just because they want to. And again, people are selling against even New York Times. I hope they're not there. I'm just using an example. They didn't sell you inventory and that was fraudulent, but there's traffic coming through their site that they didn't even buy mm -hmm. that is fraudulent and bought. So do you feel like the market has evolved to the point where if you put stringent controls in place, let's say that you do start um, you're kicking some publishers off because of who they're sourcing traffic from, you're cutting off your monetizable inventory. Is there a way, is there a business upside to that that makes up for it? Find new publishers that are less fraudulent. Right. I mean, if it's gonna affect my business on a day to day, selling against a site you know, that's delivering bad traffic and I've got clients that are unhappy, I'd rather cut them off and lower how much I can sell against until I find new publishers than just ruin my entire business where they're never gonna to wanna to work with me again. Absolutely, because again, it's, we're, this is a relationship business that we're in. So the transparency to understand what you're doing to make sure that you can work with Taco Bell even further because you know that Cheryl will want to invest in the stronger partnerships. We rely so much on technology to make the decisions and the automated decisions, we forget about the human element and the end user. Right, um, you know, the, uh, the, there, there's a formal relationship among security professionals between security and, and reputation. So reputation is actually a security mechanism, but I think that the, the sea is so vast that you can ruin your reputation somewhere and just find another place to monetize mm -hmm. right now. We're not, we're not purging them. Uh, my question is about money, right? Because we are we all buy and sell stuff and it's all connected to the dollar. So I was at a different conference, sorry Josh, <laughs> uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, there was a very interesting stat that someone put up there, which was essentially that in order to actually get, if it's even possible, with uh, you know, great cybersecurity to get complete viewability, fraud free, the cost uh, goes up quite prohibitively to where if you have 40, 50 percent fraud, that's actually worth the cost. So. I mean, would, would you, um, Cheryl, pay more? Um, or, you know, and, and I think you had mentioned this earlier, uh, how do you judge, how do you make that differentiation in general? Right, right. 
Yeah, we, um, Taco Bell, we're really, really focused on ensuring that we've got stringent um, partnerships in place with monitoring platforms and tools and the right people and right partnerships in place to ensure that there isn't fraud. Um, you know, in terms of when we find that something's not working, whether it's been viewability or bot fraud or Oh, you know, screen player sizes, all of that different stuff over the years, we move immediately to put, uh, put things in place to ensure it doesn't happen anymore. Um, we need to make sure that we're investing the franchisee's money in a credible, right, strong way uh, to instill not only the business success that we need to gain by that media investment, but also the you know, accountability we have to them um, to ensure that we're doing it in a, you know, transparent and open way uh, where, you know, there's as little fraud or lack of process as possible. You know, I, I'd like to jump in and add something to specifically this question because I see it a lot, which is it's this notion that essentially fraud is priced into the system so we don't need to worry about it. Um, what the fraud does is it adds to inventory, so it drops the nominal CPM, but but it does it in, in this way such that it just kind of gets priced in. And and we have hard data that shows that this isn't the case. Um, the, the easiest way to tell is is to look at CPMs and bot rates. If you, if 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 the bots were just sort of priced in, then body or traffic would be cheaper, and and premium human traffic would be more expensive, and that's not the case at all. We find that some dumb bot traffic is priced in because it's fairly well identified, and so the only people who buy it are the ones who sort of want the reach number. But, but the fact that there's a lot of bot traffic in video kind of puts the lie to this, because the video inventory is the absolute most expensive. We see a bunch of bot traffic in cheap inventory, and then we see a bunch of bot traffic in extremely expensive direct buy video, for instance, because of traffic sourcing on the part of publishers, which means that uh, the bot traffic is not evenly distributed across the ecosystem. It's hugely distorting particular parts of the ecosystem, but not everywhere. So it's not like one in every $10 is getting lost. It's so that there are huge losses in particular sectors or for particular buyers or for particular campaigns, while other things are getting cleaned. So it's, there's a random distribution that is therefore really, really harmful. And then finally, some of this money, like the, the, final, the final profits after everyone takes their cut, the final profits of the cybercrime goes to cyber criminals who are not doing nice things with this money. And, and if we cut it all off, that money can be reclaimed. Like it should either go back into the pockets of the buyers or it should go into the pockets of the publishers. That's just exogenous losses, uh, just money that's going to organize crime. And it, it's therefore leaving this ecosystem. So it's, 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 it's just a loss for everyone. Well, what I wonder is, you know, um, you know, companies like White Ops, there are a lot of publishers out there who don't take, you know, don't work with JavaScript or don't take tags. So I, I wonder too, you know, how much fraud there really is that we're not aware of when you've got major, major publishers um, that, that won't even allow the transparency into their inventory. That's absolutely right. Like no one will say to my face, well, Michael Tiffany, bot traffic is awesome. It just falls to the bottom line. We absolutely love it. And we don't want you to look over here. Um, instead, they'll have some technical objection that'll involve, oh, there's just so many tracking pixels. Oh, we just, we can't, sorry, our hands are tied. We can't, yeah. it'll always be a technical objection, right, no matter what. You know what kills me is, on the agency side, it's unacceptable if we were to give you that, that response. Mm -hmm. Unacceptable. But we are forced, uh, as an agency, to accept that response. Right, right. Well, we gotta pick our battles, I suppose. Right, one, one thing at a time. Um, another thing that I worry about is that we're just dislocating, even as we make victories, we're just dislocating the problem and it's going to, um, it's going to smaller buyers, right? So there's no question that White Ops is biased towards big premium buyers. And, and, and as we see bot reductions, we can't actually tell the difference between those botnets going out of business unless we get them shut down, which we, we sometimes do. Um, and then just finding other victims, especially you know small and, and medium ad buyers, which which I strongly suspect is happening, but we just we don't play there, so we're not seeing it. 
Is there anyone doing that kind of long tail or self-service buying here? It's an interesting area of exploration. Now we're all probably kind of biased towards the premium tier of the market, having shown up at a exotic resort in Santa Barbara. <laughs> All right, who else wants to share some thoughts? We have a few minutes left. All right, I'm racing to you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Abbott, uh, I'm with Millennial Media. Met a few of you uh, around the room. Uh, really interesting conversation, obviously uh, relevant to all of us. Everyone really is a loser in this whole ecosystem. And like you said, the dollars lead the system. I'm just curious, all of you know the space better, better, better than I do, and I'm sure other people in the room uh, have worked with IES or Moat or DV, and uh, what do you guys think is the best um, solution to this? I mean, we, we haven't really talked about what do you think is best case scenario, one year, three year, five year, and, and where, who funds this? I mean, because everyone's losing, but these are potentially really expensive a algorithms to build to protect this, and a tiny micro publisher uh, or even a larger publisher, New York Times, et cetera, might not have uh, the capital to invest millions and millions of dollars uh, aiming at a moving target that that technology might solve a problem for a year and then two years later uh, The cyber criminals are ahead of us. So I guess what's what's the best solution in your each of your opinions? I better let you two go first before <laughs> I always feel uh, that it needs to be a, a Combination first of all, I've never been a fan of regulating our space uh, We are all entrepreneurs and we've done a pretty amazing job to get to where we are today. And if we have somebody telling us exactly what to do within the, uh, the regulation of the internet, I don't think that we would have as much fun. That being said, I feel as if it would be a strong brand, like a Yum Brands or P&G, to work with their agency, to work with the IAB, and to work with all the verification tools to collectively invest human capital to set expectations and standards. What's happening right now is that the larger brands and the holding companies are doing something off on the side and it's all proprietary and we as an industry are not able to benefit from it. Um, you know, no act is altruistic. Everybody could gain from it, but it will need to take a strong investment uh, from larger brands, a large holding company, um, some smaller agencies that are able to really dive in also, and then uh, our, our fun IAB and the four A's. Yeah, I, I have similar feelings. I think that particularly from the brand side, right, it's the dollars start with the brands, and so that we need to come together and ensure that we are collaborating and working towards a solution that's good for all of us, all of us, not only the brands, the publishers, everyone, um, that helps to minimize this. And, you know, digital obviously is growing exponentially. So many dollars are shifting in this space, and I just can't help but say it just undermines the credibility of the space when these types of headlines get out there. And this is just, in theory, I, I saw a stat today from the Xaxis team that surprised me, but in theory, it's not huge numbers, but it is still big. And if we can come together and solve for this as brands united, you know, obviously then getting that um, to the publishers um, to work with us, we can start having many different conversations and just growing the industry and growing the great work that we're all trying to do in this space. Um, but I, I do think it starts with the brands and agencies coming together and working to push the publishers to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, so I'll add a few thoughts to this. Um, uh, I, White Ops is a security company, and what we do is botnet detection. We do malware detection. And I'm, we're just trying to undermine the economics of this crime. And I. I see us in a stage in this industry that's kind of like where financial services was about a decade ago, where part of the reason why cyber criminals were able to victimize them so well is because their criminal model scaled. So, so an attack that worked against Citi also worked against Capital One and also worked against Chase, et cetera. And, and as an industry, the, the financial services um, 
companies got together and erected ways of doing information sharing so that the crime didn't scale so well anymore. And therefore it became less profitable because, because an attack would have one victim, not 20 victims. And we're standing up some institutions like that in this space as well. So. Uh, there's going to be an MRC accreditation for fraud detection. There's a new industry group, the Trustworthy Accountability Group, that should be able to be a focal point for information sharing and also for coordination. But um, we're in an awkward place because we've raised the visibility of, of fraud as a problem and, and my outsider status is gonna show here. I'm, I was shocked by how many venture-backed ad tech companies there are with, the, it's very difficult to differentiate between them. Um, I, I think you, we've all drawn this observation, right? And um, we just created this cottage opportunity for countless ad tech companies to say, oh yeah, international cybercrime, no problem. We can take on that as well. Um, we're there for you. And uh, and it's really hard for buyers, it's really hard for agencies to differentiate between 20 companies that all say that they can take on um, cybercrime. And all of the companies that you mentioned are, are really aiming for currency. You, you can tell that a business has currency as its business goal because it, because it markets a score. You know, like Moat has the Moat score and Integral has the track score because what they want to be is in the business of being a universal currency for media transactions. Um, and so having a fraud story just has, to, like, you, you have to say you have one because, because otherwise it impacts your ability to attain the currency position. Whether or not you're able to hire, you know, an army of white hat hackers to actually do malware detection, which kind of feels like it should be a very, very specialized, narrow category. So, um, so the open question is if, if what you need to fight hackers is hackers, so if, if this is a security problem and it requires a security solution, then, then how is it paid for? Because um, this market already bears a certain cost for, for measurement and, and, and for currency um, and, and does not traditionally have security as a line item to, to budget for. So, so what's happening is that dollars are being spent on, on these guys who really just want to be the one true mash, dashboard of, of media metrics um, saying, yeah, no problem. We got, we got the cybercrime totally, totally dominated, right? Um, which doesn't really make sense uh, when you consider the massive investments being made by Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Twitter, AOL, et cetera, in-house just to take on this problem, all of which probably overwhelms in terms of budget what any of the startups are bringing to bear on the problem, and it continues to be a, you know, a big open problem. So, uh, so again, I think that kind of as a community, we're, we're underestimating the, the scope and the sophistication of what we're up against. I, um, that might be... Uh, should, should I end on cool. I want to uh, monologuing? Give a great round of applause for this group. This was a tough topic to tackle.